my background is I am an occupational therapist. How many of you are working with an occupational therapist now? I would love to see more hands than that. Uh, OT for me, obviously, it's what I do and I love my job, but I really feel like it's such an important part when you're working with these kids from hard places. My background is I was being, uh, I was one of the forerunner people in autism, and I did a lot of sensory processing with autism. And I could look at those kids and help them calm down or help them upregulate. We call it upregulating or downregulating, and they're nonverbal, right? And so a lot of my research and my trainings and things were with that population. And then you heard Robin talking about Dr. Bruce Perry. And Dr. Bruce Perry heard about my work in autism, and he contacted me when he started the um, Child Trauma Academy out in Houston and the Neurosequential Model of Therapeutics. And he said, we really need an OT on board who has a good handle of this sensory piece where we can bring that in because kids who come from hard places often act like kids who have autism. They can't express to us what it is they're feeling. They can't express to us in words what they need from their caregivers. And so that's kind of where I got started. And then Dr. Purvis, Dr. Karen Purvis, heard about my work with Dr. Perry. And she said, would you come on to the TBRI team at TCU? And would you help develop our curriculum for the sensory profiles and things like that? So that's kind of what I do. An occupational therapist, if you're not familiar with what we do, we go to a medical school. It is a medical degree. And it's crazy hard to get into. So the majority of us have, you know, really high grades and things like that. And so we tend to be overachievers. We tend to be the type of person that loves to do a bunch of different research. And we're just always excited about new things. Many of us go into rehab and we work on the neurosystem. So when you heard Robin referring to the stroke study, where if you want someone who's had a stroke to go back and learn these skills, you have to go back to where they would have gone to developmentally, those are OTs that are developing a lot of those theories and a lot of that research. And so we have a really great understanding of the brain and the sensory uh, body and how all these processes go. And what I want to do today is to translate that into something that would be tangible for you. I'm very, very passionate about giving practical ideas and practical tips and making it fun. And if I can bring some humor into your life, I consider that a big win. I have a background. It's interesting. I, I am a woman of faith, and I love to speak in churches. That makes me very <laughs> excited to see the church community come along this um, community because we're supposed to love the orphans and the widows. And I think that it's just so amazing. Fostering hope is something that I'm really involved with up in the Austin community. And Julie Corey and I are really good friends and I worked with her kids, and that's how she brought me in. And I just love when we can come together and, and show, you know, love like Christ loved into this, this community. And um, where was I going with that? Marshall, you don't even know, do you? I, I lost my... I'm so... <laughs> woman of faith. <laughs> yes, there you go. I'm a woman of faith. Um, so I pray about my kids. I don't even know where I was tracking with that. I, I, I'm relying on my slides here, but that's okay. Um, so what I want to do is I want to kind of teach you guys how to look at what your child is currently doing and then be able to translate that into, well, how does that look like on Robin's continuum and, and what stage are they in and then how do I co-regulate with them to come out of that. So to begin with, we kind of have to know our neuroanatomy and we have to understand how does the brain make neural connections, right? So I love the example that another OT gave to me, which was there are cows that are in a pasture. I'm so happy to see these slides right now. <laughs> I'm going to hug this ma'am. <laughs> ah, okay. So that is, that's basically my house right there. And I work out of my home. I tend to see the kids that are the hardest kids that have been through several OTs. Uh, and they are looking for somebody that kind of has, has an out-of-the-box treatment approach. And so that's where I end up. I don't work a lot. I might see one kid a week because I also have my own children that are dysregulated as well. I have a daughter who is now 13. And when she was born, I was undergoing chemotherapy. And what we learn about the brain and brain development is in utero exposure to things can cause a lot of problems too. And a lot of you are dealing with 
foster adoptive children who had uh, difficult in utero experiences. And so from my medical background, I came at that from a very uh, procedural uh, focus, and I was very structured with her. In OTs, we tend to be very structured. You come in and you've lacerated this tendon, we're going to give you these specific exercises to get that tendon working back up. And when I met Dr. Perry and Dr. Purvis, it changed my approach significantly to add that connection piece into it. And when I added that connecting protocol and, and the connected principles that we talk about, thank you so much, then it really opened up a lot of what I was able to do with my own daughter who presented with a lot of sensory issues. And I, I like to use her as an example. I have to be very careful because she is a 13-year-old young lady now, <laughs> so sometimes she doesn't like me to talk a lot about her. And I need to be respectful of that, right? i got to practice what I preach. But I have lived where you have that meltdown that lasts for three hours. And when you are a specialist with autism and dysregulation and your child is melting down for three hours, I promise you there is a lot of guilt <laughs> and there's a lot of negative feelings that surround that. So when I learned about some of these connecting principles and we're I was able to diffuse that so much faster and we still have the meltdowns. We, I have to go home tonight and apologize to her because we had a massive dysregulation just yesterday. She was working on her Latin homework and she couldn't figure out one of the problems and she spiraled into if I don't get an A in this class you're not going to let me do my theater class and I'm not going to be able to blah, blah, blah. And, and she does that spiraling where she just gets so out of control and I did not handle it well and I was like yes you're right <laughs> if you don't get an A in Latin I'm gonna pull you out of your theater class <laughs> but it's because you're not trying and if you would just try then I don't care if you get a C in Latin but if you're gonna cross your arms and not do the work yeah, I'm going to pull you out of your extracurriculars. But I didn't handle that, right? You know, and, and, and that's those types of things that even when we're specialists, we have to go back and make those repairs every single day. Um, and Marshall, I've lost my PowerPoint here. Let's see. Maybe we'll, we'll try that. See what happens here. That looks pretty good, right? Part of it is I don't know how to use a Mac. I don't know how to click anything. <laughs> so well, there we go. Does this work? That works. We're good. Okay, so that is my house. Uh, I use the equipment that I set up for my own daughter, and I see my clients with that. And then what's really fun is I would train all over the world uh, in the country, and I would talk about these neurosensory assessments and how we pick the right activity to match the behavior that we're seeing. And people would say, well, what do I do about a teenager? And I had lots of great ideas, and I had lots of tips and lots of things that I could share with them. And then God kind of looked at me, and he said, you know what? I think you'd be better at this if you had more personal experience. Kind of like your whole autism thing got better when you had your own kid. Let's do that. So I do have a sister who struggles with alcohol and drug abuse. And as a result of some of her life choices, her daughter ran away from the foster situation she was in when she was 18 years old because she could do that. She turned 18 and she left. She ended up on my doorstep two days after her 18th birthday. And because of that, <laughs> we got to foster an 18-year-old uh, with a really traumatic background. And again, that is her story to tell. Uh, and she stayed with us for two years. And that was a lot of fun, too, to hear you know, not only did I get my first teenager overnight, we literally received a phone call that said, hey, you know, she's coming your way. And, and we were like, oh, okay, that's great. <laughs> I don't even have a bedroom for this kid, but we'll figure it out. So I've done both of those, and I learned a lot along the process. And one of my favorite tips that I will show, uh, personal stories I'll share with you, that being at this type of a conference and learning this compassionate, connected care when she arrived, my husband is a programmer. He's a tech guy. We have a strict rule in our house, and my children are 10 years old and 13 years old, so this is a really easy role to, a rule to enforce, but we don't have any tech in the bedrooms. We've just seen how lots of things can happen in a closed door when you involve technology. So rule in my house, all the tech stays out in common areas, and when you go to bed, it gets plugged in in the living room. So this 18-year-old, who literally is a runaway at this point, um, moved from Indiana to Austin, Texas, brings her cell phone into my home, and we sit down and we tell her, you can't have your cell phone in your room. And she's pretty much like, F you, I'm going to have my cell phone in my room. And so it was a couple nights of 
she took her cell phone in her room again, and da 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 da. Well, my husband, bless his heart, he gets to hear all my lectures and you know sits in with me because I go pretty cool places. You know, we're going to Australia, and he thinks that's cool, so he goes to Australia with me, and he has to you know part of the pittance is you got to sit in the workshop, <laughs> so he knows a lot of these same things. And I was so upset, and the whole, like, this is the only rule we have for her. This is the only rule we're enforcing at this point, and she can't even do that. And he was able to remind me, this is her lifeline to her old life. All of her friends are on that social media. She has uprooted her life, even though it was her choice to run away. This is her connection. And yes, they're not good connections, but they are her connections. And until we can build that connection She's not going to be able to put her phone down. And when I was able to just look at the behavior through a different lens of why, it was way less personal. Does that make sense? How many times does your child do something and you look at it from a very personal standpoint of if they respected me and if they knew how much you know, work we were going through to try and have this relationship with her, she'd at least keep her cell phone. I, we're not asking much. Right? But if you frame it as this is her lifeline to her past, oh, well, then I'm the one that needs to be more empathetic. And so I think that's what Robin was talking about this morning is a lot of if you can just not, you know, take, take the heart behind what they're doing and sometimes it diffuses the meaning behind it, right? So, okay, moving on. A couple resources for you for when we're done with our time here. This is all in that link that you all received, the email that Stacy sent out, has all these links in there. A couple of the things that I've done is one, I've created a podcast, and hopefully Robin is gonna be joining me soon. I did a podcast with her, and she's gonna do one with me, and I'm so excited to have that on there. But I've got a series, and it's called Trauma Tips. And that is where we look at all these different areas that I usually get referrals for. I get referrals for sleep, I get referrals for eating, issues, I get referrals for ADHD, kids that keep touching everything, kids that can't sit still. The things that I see a lot of referrals for, I've decided, well, what if I could do a 20-minute tutorial of when they're doing this, it might be because of this, right? And so those are all on there. It's, it's the martyot.podbeam.com, and it's also, if you go to Creative Therapies, that's my website, and you can link onto that trauma tip series there as well and get some more trainings. And they're all free. It's completely you know, free. I pay for the subscription on my end, and then it's free to you guys, and you can share it with your friends and whoever else. So the other thing that I've done is created a trauma-informed OT resources Pinterest board for those of you that are on Pinterest. I try and go through. I'm in the process <laughs> right now. Uh, my deadline is March 10th. And by March 10th, Dr. Perry wants me to have a uh, brain-organized Pinterest area where I kind of go through and say, okay, the diencephalon, you know, matches these different things, sleep and appetite and all that. And then we get into the frontal cortex and motor planning. And, and so I'm going to have all these little subcategories in there for you, hopefully by, Mar or by uh, yeah, March 10th is my deadline for that. So right here is where I kind of put the things that I find that I think would be useful for you as you're trying to become more sensory trauma informed. So another free resource for you to go on and, and see what other people are doing as well, not just my work, but there's a lot of really cool things that are coming about. And I'm so excited to hear more people talk about trauma informed. But in my opinion, it's not, it's not enough to be trauma informed. We have to be trauma practiced. We have to move from informed into practice. And it's really hard. As I was sitting there with my daughter yesterday, and she was crying, and she was like, you just won't even let me express my feelings. <laughs> Talk about stabbing the heart of what I do for a living, right? <laughs> like, she knows that button. And I'm like, no, feelings, feelings are fine. <laughs> As I'm listening to myself going, oh, Oh, man, that's so convicting. <laughs> so there you go. It's not enough, though, for us to know what to do. We have to do it. And I'm happy to say that I did calm it down and we were fine. And I'm going to go back and apologize. So when we understand how the brain is formed, then we're better equipped on how to change the brain. So I'm going to get really general because we only have an hour and a half together today. And I'm going to say, in general, the brain goes from the back to the front in its developmental sequence. And it goes from the inside to the outside, again, in its developmental sequence. 
What I want you to pay attention to, though, is the parts of the brain, and above I have put general age categories, okay? Oversimplified, but it helps you give a big picture. When you have a baby, a baby is not working on planning and coordination, right? If the baby can't get out of its crib, we don't get frustrated with the baby, do we? We don't have an expectation for that. The baby is working on vision. But here's where that gets interesting. Dr. Perry has done a lot of research on MRIs of the brain, and he does a lot of questionnaires and a lot of research with parent data that he collects. And what he finds is early trauma affects that critical window of development, is what it's called. And when we are one years old, our visual, visual system is really what's getting the hottest um, portion of development, right? Think of it, a one-year-old. What does a one-year-old do? They look around a whole lot, and they're using their eyes to track things, and they're supposed to be crawling at this point. And what's interesting is when you crawl, you get down on all fours, and you're using both sides of your body, right? And when you use both sides of your body, you use both sides of your brain. So both of your eyes are being engaged from a neuro level. And those eyes are scanning the environment. And the other thing that's interesting is when you're down on all fours, if you think through, you can't look around without look, lifting up your eyes upwards, right? That is an important thing to remember. Because where do our eyes go when we are trying to hold our stuff together? When you get frustrated, you might flap your hands, you might take a deep breath, but where do your eyes go? They go up, right? This, you could do EDM, EMDR, it's a whole theory, a whole training on using your eyes for self-regulation. So when a child is crawling, it's when their, their base of their neck hits their spinal cord and they can't physically look up without moving their eyeballs. Right? So if we have a child with trauma who was laid into a bed or stayed in a crib, guess what happens to their eyes? Their eyes go left and right. Their eyes don't go up. There's nothing for them to look at above them. When we take a child well-intended and we put it in a car seat and we move it from place to place within this car seat, when we carry the child and we put the child facing out in these baby carriers, how is the vision system developing? It's not. So when you have developmental neglect early in life when the visual system is supposed to be developing, it will get caught. And that system will not catch up. I promise you one of the main things I see in my practice is kids cannot look up without moving their head. Easy, something you can go home and do right now. Look at your child who comes from that hard background. <laughs> take something interesting. For some kids, it can be your finger. Others, you got to get a little bit more exciting and take a lollipop or something. And just do this. Go back and forth and up and down. If your child goes like this, then you know they had early developmental trauma and their visual system did not get developed appropriately. That's all fun. It's a nice little party fact to share to people, but let me take it a step further. We're going to talk about the vestibular system, right? Here's another fact. If you feel sleepy at all right now, where positionally can you place your head to put you into upregulation? How can you alert yourself simply by moving your head? What, where do you put your head? If you want to wake up, do you go like this? What do you do? You look up. So if a child is trying to calm down and use their visual system to calm down, but they can't because their eyes don't go up because they never developed that skill, what do they do to compensate? What do they do? They look up. If you're in a classroom and you're trying to look from the board to your paper and you can't look up, you now are labeled with ADHD. Because instead of calming yourself down, you've actually done the opposite and alerted yourself, right? So it's, this is what I want to teach you today, is if we can understand the little hiccups that can happen developmentally, and we can look at this child and say, oh my goodness, his visual system is off. We just need to do some vision therapy. And all of a sudden, whoo, he calms down. Hey, that's so exciting, right? So that's what I want to talk about today. But we have to understand that you have to be able to have your visual system before you can have visual memory. 
you have to have your visual system before you can go into movement and sensory. If you had a hiccup around four to five years old, a lot of uh, sexual abuse is going to happen between five and six years old, especially for little girls. That's one of the heightened uh, numbers that we have found when we do studies because that's when they're curious about their sexuality. The normal developmental sequence between five and six is we're looking on their sexual identity, they're getting through that movement, sensory, they're kind of getting into that processing area, and they're curious. How many of you, when you were in kindergarten, first grade, played doctor with somebody? It is a common thing. But what happens with this population, because they were sexually abused when they were younger, they go through that normal developmental sequence of getting curious about the other sex, and all of a sudden we label them, and we freak out. I had a kid one time, um, he was on the playground, and he was showing himself to his little, little girls on the playground. He had been sexually abused, right? So he had different meaning behind it, but it was curious. The little girls were curious. So they are in this private Christian preschool. He starts showing himself on the playground, and let me tell you, those parents were mad, as they should be. That's a big deal, right? These moms went crazy. And how they handled it was they said, okay, little girl, you're not allowed to talk to this little boy anymore. You shun him. You ostracize him. Don't be near him because I need to protect my little girl from seeing this little boy. Even though normal developmental sequence. Did anybody else get into the National Geographics when they were in this age? <laughs> right? Like, you're curious. <laughs> you want to know. You're looking at those natives going, oh, my gosh. Look, they have boobs. It's exciting. <laughs> it's not exciting. It's, it's developmentally appropriate. And there's nothing sexual about it. It's curiosity. So they shun this kid. And I finally had to have a meeting. The teacher brought me in, and I sat these moms down, and I said, you know what he's trying to do? His past, his background, he was taught if you let me touch you, or if you touch me, if you do these sexual favors for me, I will love you. I'm not going to give you any attention unless it's in this type of environment. When you want to be fed, well, you've got to service these people first. Think of this mentality. So, yeah, he's pulled out of that environment. He was saved. He was put in a good foster home. But he just wanted to have a friend, and he got neural connections as an infant that if you want a friend, if you want someone to love you, pay attention to you, look you in the eye, you do these services. So him showing himself to these little girls, that was him saying, I want to be a friend. That's all it was. And what did we do? Did we help him make a friend? No. We shut him out. What difference it made when we finally got to the heart of that, and I said, you know what, why don't, instead of that, why don't we give him a job? Let him be the leader at the playground. He gets to hold the, the chalk, and the kids have to come to him to get the chalk to do their drawings. He gets to hold the balls. He gets to hold whatever equipment is going to be used that day. So now we have an appropriate social engagement. We've made him a leader. The kids are seeking him out. And he's out in the middle of the playground for everybody to see. He can't drop his pants in front of everybody. His hands are busy, right? <laughs> so why can't we start treating these behaviors by finding the root and saying, what is the child really seeking? They're seeking connection. And as Robin said, so many times they're really just seeking connection, okay? So, but we got to know where, where did the hiccup occur? Because it's, it's a developmental sequence. It's a neuro sequence. Uh, Dr. Perry has coined the phrase neurosequential, right? It happens in a sequence in the nervous system. And you have to go back and fix it before you move forward. So when you look at inside out, a way that I, I tell kind of people that are new to all this is if you look at the hippocampus and you look at the thalamus, and that amygdala area, the thalamus actually starts out looking like a fetus, right? Which is kind of fun. It's totally anecdotal. I don't think it means anything in the big world of neurology, but it's fun for me to point out because then you'll remember. <laughs> and that's where your emotional center is. So if you had early abuse, early neglect, in utero abuse, in utero neglect, then you're going to have issues with emotional regulation. 
so we can develop some empathy for that, right? And when you practice things, they get bigger. And we'll get into that here in just a minute. So when you look at the growing pattern of the brain and you kind of look at the MRIs and the gray matter and the density, what's fascinating is if you look at where all of the neurons are when you're born. And here's just another way to look at that. When you're born, all of your neurons are already in your brain, although about two years ago we started doing some new studies and we've discovered that you actually can create new neurons, which is really exciting, but it's insignificant, which is less exciting. <laughs> in, in theory, and, and what we need to understand is most of our neurons are in the back of our brain when we're born. And what happens is as we have experiences in our life, these little neurons create synapses and connections. And if you could think of it as like they're building a highway within your brain and they're building what we call neuro connections, which is basically all these little dendrites and neurons stacking into each other and they go to a specific place and it happens in milliseconds. And the more you practice it, the more the sensations will fire and the more neurons will move to that area. And this is where it's fun to be an OT because I had to do a lot of this study when I worked with stroke rehab. When you have a stroke when you're a baby, I'm not too concerned. So many kids have strokes in utero that you don't even know about it. A lot of kids will have a stroke at birth. They'll have some sort of a, an, an issue where they don't have um, good oxygen to the brain and part of it will die or something. And you have, you can see these infarcts or a blood clot or something will happen. And you can look on the MRI and you can see this dense area where the brain is dead. But if I, as the therapist, come along and I stimulate that portion of development, I, I move that arm in the sequence that a baby is supposed to move it, then the neurons literally go around what we call the infarct or the area of injury and they will make new neural connections. So if you have a brain injury when you're young, there is a high likelihood that you can rehab and do really, really well. Especially if you have a frontal cortex injury when you're young, guess what? All your neurons are back in the back anyway. You didn't damage anything. You didn't sever any connections. You take a 30-year-old and you give him a frontal lobe injury and guess what happens? He is in trouble. We have a lot of executive function decision problems and things like that because his neurons are already there and now that highway has been cut. And there's no new neurons coming forward to create new connections. Everybody with me? But child trauma, I'm sad because it's kids, but I'm excited because their brain is plastic. So everyone in this room, if you have young children, you have a brain that is like Play-Doh. And there are so many neurons just waiting back here to move forward. It's so exciting. And we can go around a lot of the damage that was done to them early, which is really exciting for me. So if you just kind of look at it, it's the different colors. And then I, I tried, to, yeah, I like colors. I try to make things simple for you to understand. And let's be honest, for me to understand too. Sometimes I read these books and I'm like, oh, that was really heavy. <laughs> it's a lot of big Latin words in this book. <laughs> I need to kind of digest it a little. Uh, so I like colors. And so I kind of go when you're a newborn, all your neurons are in the back. And then the adult, those are the dark ones and they move forward, but not till you're 17 plus right? And what's really cool is there's an eight time synaptic density increase when the neurons seek their positions. And that's usually between the ages of three to five. So three to five and zero to three as well are really big areas for growth where a lot of those things are moving forward. So exciting at the changes that we can make. And another way I like to look at it is this other OT gave me the suggestion of when we make these neural connections, it's like looking at the brain as if it was a giant field. And in this field, as you walk down through the grass or through the blue bonnets, because we're in Texas, it creates a pathway. And that's why they're like, don't walk in the blue bonnets. They don't want to just step on them, right? <laughs> it's actually a myth. You can pick them. It's fine. But if we were in a pasture and you put a cow in that pasture, if one cow is in the pasture and one cow walks through the field, you can kind of see where the grass is laid down. Are you with me? But if I put a lot of cattle in the pasture and they're all going to the same water source, what happens? It becomes a trail. 
When we want to go hiking or biking, if we go to any of our national parks, we go out, we can see the trailhead, right? And what do you do? Most people, when you come to a trailhead, where do you go? You follow the trail, <laughs> right? And that's what your neurons do as well. So when you have any experience, you can imagine your brain being a big field and cows up in your brain walking around laying down these pathways. Now what's interesting is not all pathways are made the same. They don't carry, carry the same weight. And we're going to lead with that large proprioceptive exaggeration and input, which I'm going to get to in, in just a minute. But I want to talk also about when we make our paths, we do it through connection, right? We don't take an infant and place food in front of them and walk out of the room. We mirror what that infant is supposed to do. Have you ever seen a new mom feed a baby that's just getting new solids? If you had no context for that, you would think she's crazy, <laughs> right? Because what is she doing? Um, nom, 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 mm, nom, nom. They're moving their tongue all around, right? <laughs> when we teach things, it makes us do crazy stuff. But it's that connection. They have to see it being done. You've got to be with them. I can't take my daughter out or my son out and say, here's a bicycle, best of luck. <laughs> they will have no idea what to do with that. One of my favorite YouTube videos right now is they have given 17-year-olds a rotary-dialed phone. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's hilarious. They have no idea what to do with this, right? If you haven't seen it, Google it, look it up. The other one that's funny, the Holderness family, which I love the Holderness family, they did one where the kids from the 80s and they had their kids drinking from a hose. You would think with drinking fountains, this is not a foreign concept. Oh my gosh, my kids, I was like, okay, let's prove them wrong, guys. And my kids were like, like, it was hilarious. It was one of the funniest things I've ever done. Take your kid, give him a hose, and say, get a drink. And they're, like, going to drown themselves. Because, <laughs> because we lead through example. And that's just what Robin was saying. If we're not regulated, they can't be regulated. They're watching us constantly for these cues. Getting back to our path, if I put a giant bull in the path, how many times does that giant bull have to walk before I get to see where the path goes? Not a lot, Right? But if I put a little bunny rabbit in the path and it hops along, how many bunny rabbits is, is it going to take to make a pathway? A lot, unless they're hungry, then they'll chew it down for you. But that's kind of what we want to think about when we're making these neural connections. They're not all made the same, right? So some of our neural pathways are made intensely. So when we add the amygdala and those center structures that develop really early and we learn from research and MRIs on kids that when they've had early experiences of trauma and they get into that fight or flight system, guess what happens? They're sending a lot of neurons into that amygdala. They're sending so much of their neural army into the emotional regulation that that is really beefy and really hard and really strong. They've got so many big bulls in their brain going there that any type of stimulus that happens, they show up at that crossroad and they go down that path. So we call them triggers sometimes in our world, right? And that basically means there's been a huge neural event that has mowed down that pathway for that child. Or we have the opposite. We have the child who has these neural experiences, but they're non-significant. I want to teach you to tie your shoe. So I teach you how to tie your shoe one time. Is that enough? No, because is tying your shoe an emotional event? Shouldn't be. <laughs> Unless your mom's an OT and she's over there going, how come you can't tie your shoe? I teach this for a living, by God. Nobody's ever taught you. Well, fine. You should be able to do it anyway. <laughs> kidding. I never actually had that conversation. Uh, but it's not an emotional event. Here's something interesting I hope hits home for you every once in a while. Grabbing your backpack or bringing your backpack home. Being told, put your backpack in this position. Is that a high emotional event? It shouldn't be. 
So guess what happens? Even though I've done it every day for an entire semester, I don't remember it because I'm sending bunnies into that pathway, right? Does this make sense? So that's why some of these things, these kids just don't pick up because they're not emotional. You want the kid to remember to put their backpack there, you've got to get emotional. And I propose, let's not yell at them and make it a negative emotion, What's really fun is we can make it a fun emotion too. And when we bring music and proprioceptive input, which I'll talk about in a minute, that's a fun, heighten up, make that bunny into a bowl connection. You want your kid to put your backpack in a certain place when he comes home? When he walks in, you're like, backpack here. Oh yeah, and you get silly and you dance and they're gonna be looking at you like, that is freaky. I'm gonna remember this moment. <laughs> and then they will put their backpack where you want them to put it. But if every day when they come home and you're like, you didn't put your backpack where it's supposed to go. You didn't put your backpack where it's supposed to go. You're, you're sending rabbits into this kid's brain. They're not going to remember that. Okay? So remember, you can have big events that create big pathways. And little events, you have to have a lot of them. Okay? And part of that neural connection, and again, we don't have a whole lot of time, um, is that we lead through large input. The other thing I want to talk about is the proprioceptive system. And I'm going to get into this a little bit more later on. Dancing. How many of you, when Robin showed that video, you felt that in your body? How many of you wanted to dance with them? Anybody else was like, oh, I just can we flash mob here? That's my dream. I want to be part of a flash mob. But I'm extroverted, right? I get that. But because we felt it, and then we remember it as well, because the proprioceptive system is like having a big bowl. Have you seen uh, when people get ready to go swimming, or they're doing baseball, or they're doing golf, and they weight down their bat, or they weight down their club, or they weight down their arms? Or you see a runner. A runner doesn't get ready to run like this, right? Have you ever seen an athlete at the beginning of the game going, I am ready to play. What do you see? They're doing this, right? They're moving around. They're jumping. They're smacking their muscles. That's the proprioceptive system. When you engage the proprioceptive system, you're waking your system up, and you're making all these neuro connections into giant bowls so that when they do that three or that, you know, the, the, sh the thing that you do with the ball for the team, <laughs> right? <laughs> go sports team, um, they remember it because they have woken up that proprioceptive system. So, so remember that as we're talking about these different activities in the sensory system is, is different input is going to register differently in the brain. So what's really fun is we have these optimal times, but I'm sitting here talking to a group of people that work with youth who did not develop appropriately. That's why we're here today. Something happened that interrupted that neurodevelopmental sequence. And the problem is I can't go back with my five-year-old picky eater who didn't develop the oral motor skills. This child was given a bottle for the first three years of his life, so his tongue doesn't work the right way. He feels like he's going to gag and he's going to not be able to breathe as he's eating because his tongue doesn't work. And here's a little anecdote. And again, I, I know I'm speaking quickly, but we, we have a very small amount of time and I'm trying to just give you lots of like practical things. What kind of food doesn't make you want to choke? If your tongue doesn't move back and forth, let's go back to the beginning. Do we start babies with lemonade? Do we start them with water? No, it's, a, it's sweet, it is sweet, but it's also a thickened liquid. Milk is pretty thick. If you've ever had a cold, you know how thick milk is, right? And then, do we move from that into beef? What do we do next? Soft, pureed, we call them mechanical soft foods. Because in oral motor development, the first way the tongue goes is back and forth which is great when you're sucking on a nipple, and it gets the fluid in, right? But what's interesting with a baby is the back of their neck, this whole internal stuff, is made so that they can't choke. 
But as they grow, you actually develop airways, and your airways open up, so now you can choke when you're eating. And if you only are still doing front and back, if any food gets into your cheeks, guess what you do? You aspirate on it, and you choke. So if a child did not get good developmental, good oral motor, they weren't talked to, they weren't rolled their R's to, they weren't <laughs> stimulated in all these different ways, their tongue is not going to go left to right. So what kinds of food does your tongue need to go left and right in order to fo form a ball and swallow without choking? What kind of food you, do you have to kind of clean out of your teeth and get on the sides? What's that? Carrots? Hard foods? Popcorn? Meats? Vegetables? Unless your vegetable is pureed or steamed, you're going to have to go into the pockets of your mouth to get it. So what foods do our kids not eat? Vegetables and proteins. Because their tongue doesn't go side to side. They, feel, they legitimately feel like they're going to choke and die when you hand them a steak and you're like, I paid good money for that steak. You should eat this steak. You know how much I paid for this steak? This is a treat for you to get this steak. <laughs> and they get mad at you and they don't eat it. Well, here's another thing about food that's interesting. What are the basic needs as a caregiver that we're supposed to provide? Clothing, shelter, and... I challenge you to find a social event that does not involve food. Can you find one? Even funerals, we, we enter the world with birthday cake and we exit with a buffet, right? When someone's upset, we set up a care calendar. And what do we do with that care calendar? We feed them. Even Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory, they're their hot beverage, right? Let's go out. Does anybody ever say, hey, let's go out and watch traffic to bond? No, we go to tea, we go to coffee, we go to the bar. We, we drink to make social connections. So when the child is a picky eater, we as caregivers are like, oh my gosh, I can't feed my child. And that hits our core. I paid a lot of money for this steak. Now you're in my finances trigger, right? And it's really good. I can't believe I can't share this experience with you. I love steak. Why don't you like steak? But what foods do they like? What foods bowl us nice and easy? Chicken nuggets. You don't have macaroni and cheese, hot dogs, bread. What is that? Takis and hot Cheetos. Yes. So what foods do these kids eat? Carb-rich, sugar-laden foods. And guess what that does to their neurochemistry? What? makes it a video game, <laughs> right? They're not getting the nutrition they need because they can't orally process it. So rather than get mad that they're not eating the steak, how about we give them a lollipop and we say, hey, here's a lollipop. I want to see if you can move it around your mouth. Go home. Put, put a Cheeto in their mouth. They're going to eat a Cheeto because they bowl us nice and they swallow quickly. You don't choke on them. Give them the Cheeto and say, hey, let's play a game. Can you move the Cheeto around? And if the kid's like, Wow, we need to get a speech therapist in here. And then they'll eat your steak. But you can't expect them to eat proteins and vegetables if they feel like they're going to die. Because when you have a choking experience, guess what kind of neural connection that becomes? That's high emotion. That's the biggest steer in the land. Has anybody ever choked on a food? Will you eat that food again? No. Have you ever even gotten sick after eating at a certain place? And do you eat at that place anymore? No. Do you know why? Because the mouth is so powerful as an emotional center. Our first connected experiences are through the mouth. And even now our social connected experiences are through the mouth. So when we assault the mouth, when we vomit, when we choke, when we do something to the mouth... It shuts our connections down, and we build up big barriers to not feel that way again, right? So, if, and if that doesn't give you an extra level of compassion for kids who are orally abused, I don't know what else I can do for you. 
but, but when I hear a kid that was like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like we need so much compassion with this because not only is their nutrition intake going to be affected, but their connections are going to be affected as well. And we need to make that mouth a pleasant experience. We got to do bubbles. We got to do, you know, kissing different things, um, you know, whether it's animals or very non-threatening things that we'll get into a little bit later. But we're talking about oral motor. I got on a, on a sidetrack there. But I can't look at that child when I'm trying to work on that oral motor skills and be like, come on, num, 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 move it like this. If they're five and if they're 10, if I get a kid that's 10 that will eat nothing but chicken nuggets and I sit down next to them and go, here comes the potatoes, what are they going to do? They're going to hit me. <laughs> They're going to leave. They're going to go into the fight, flight, or freeze. They're going to dysregulate somehow, right? So we need to find ways that we can get into that vestibular or that, um, that system that has been dysfunctional. So here's a photo when we talk about the eyes. And I know this kid was left in a bassinet or on the floor. Or I know that this kid did not develop the visual system correctly. Well, if they're a baby, guess what we do to babies? We get down and we go peekaboo, right? We, we hide and then we come back. We teach them all these visual skills as infants and it's really fun. We exaggerate our facial expressions. But you can't do that to a 13 year old, right? So what do you do? You, you sit next to them. You look through the balloons. That's why I love that Robin gave you the ideas of bubbles and balloons. And what's fascinating is if you toss a balloon at someone, it is a reflex to catch it. And I'll get into the visual system a little bit more about why that is. But give them things to co-gaze at, co-regulate, co-gaze, do it with them. Have a magazine that you're looking at together. Have an iPhone that you're looking at together. Look at something together and then every once in a while steal some eye contact with them, right? Have the game where you play where you put, you know, things up on the, the, the headbands or something like that that gets them looking in your direction to encourage eye contact in a really non-freaky, non-threatening way. Because this kind of eye contact, hi, hello, <laughs> creepy, <laughs> really creepy. But like, oh, oh, I'm looking, mm, it looks like same activity, different outcome. So try and think through these activities of what could I do that would mimic early child development that would be more socially appropriate for the age that we're in. Okay, so the other thing I want to, and again, I'm giving you highlights. A lot of these topics that I'm going through, you can go to those pod beans, and I talk for 30 minutes on the visual system and all that. So, but highlights today, how movement affects the brain chemistry. And this is one of my favorite topics, and how nothing happens in isolation. And that's really important to know. Sensory integration, a lot of people will talk about it, and it, it's been a buzzword for a long time, and it's so hard to understand and to figure out, well, I, I don't know, she said to, to spin them, right? And so I took them on the playground, and I increased their playground activity, and we put swings up, and it just made them crazier. Like, this didn't work. Because you're not just giving vestibular input, you're also giving proprioceptive input. When I'm in the clinic, and I have a kid that's swinging, and they jump off the swing, and they crash in my big ball pit, I'm giving them proprioceptive input, that joints jumping, pushing on your muscles, in addition to the vestibular. Does that make sense? When we watch that flash mob, yes, it was music. And when you hear music, most of us think we listen with our ears, right? But did we feel the music too? We did. So the different type of input you're going to have Yes, auditory input, but you also have proprioceptive input when you listen to music. We had some visual input with that too. We saw them running and we saw facial expressions. So it's hard to study the sensory system because most of it doesn't happen in isolation. You're not going to only be touched. You're going to look and you're going to see where you've been touched. So your visual system is now engaged as well. Does this make sense? So let's break that down for you a little bit and talk about how the neurochemistry is affected by these different movements. But you also have to understand that each system is going to be receiving different types of input. So when the child is trying to look up and they tilt their head back, we're thinking of their the visual system, but they've actually just engaged the vestibular system too. Does this make sense to you guys? 
So when you're working with a kid and you're saying, okay, I want to calm them down, which means I want to bring them into flexion, and I want to move them forward, but they're like this the whole time, they're actually going to be going into extension, which means they're going to be alerting themselves. So when you look at these activities and you're trying to figure out what's alerting and what's calming, it's important to realize that it might be visually calming and vestibularly alerting at the same time. And what's great about that is that's where we get the yin and the yang, right? So when we take a kid and we put them on their knee, a toddler, and we're tickling them, right? And we're giving them light touch tactile information that's upregulating to them. And they're like, ooh, that's exciting. But we're bouncing them on our knee at the same time. When we bounce them, that is calming input. That's deep proprioceptive input. So now we have a child that is just right regulated with us. Does everybody understand that? Because so many times I'll get a parent and they only tickle the child and the child loses their mind because they're not doing anything to bring them down. When you're putting them to bed at night and you're stroking them lightly or you're tickling them or you're having the stuffed animals touch them lightly because it's not safe to touch them yourself, and we'll get into that. Uh, but if you're doing those kinds of things, you've got to really smush them at the same time. You've got to stimulate both things, okay? So with that, the analysis of the vestibular response, and I want to hit the vestibular hard because the vestibular is one of the main regulators that we have. When you are tired, you move your head to alert yourself, right? And, and the vestibular system is in the inner part of the brain. The nerves that go to the vestibular system are really close to the ones that control your digestion and control your hearing and all these different things. So whenever you mess up with the vestibular system, you, you kind of get nauseous as well, right? Like it's just tied to so many things because your main goal in life is to keep your head from hitting the floor, right? So we want to keep our head up. And so many of our kids, they act ADHD. They're running around all the time. That's one of the number one complaints I get is the kid moves too much. They can't sit still. They're constantly running here and there. And it's because they're looking for vestibular input. And what I want to highlight for you is when you look at the vestibular input, it's all right here in these semicircular canals. And if you look, they go different directions. And the way the input is registered for us is when we have these little semicircular canals here, our head moves in different planes or different patterns of movement, and it will stimulate different parts of the vestibular system. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So when we think of that, we can understand better what type of input we are giving to the child. And the effect of the vestibular input can last up to six hours. So if you want to do a vestibular uh, sensory diet for a kid, you only have to do this two times a day and you're going to make it through the whole 12 hours, right? So the effects can last a long time. And the other thing you want to ask is, is it rhythmic or not? Because anything that is irrhythmic, if it happens off the beat, then it's going to be more alerting versus if it's rhythmic, it's going to be calming. Okay, so taking your head, even if you're going like this, back and forth in a very rhythmic movement, that's going to be on the calming end of the spectrum versus this kind of stuff. That's irrhythmic, and so it's going to be more alerting, right? Does this make sense? It'll make sense when we start talking about programming as we're coming up in a minute. So... The other thing you want to look at is as you use those different canals and how the fluid moves through them as you move your head. So as you're going like this, then the canal that runs this way, as you're going, that fluid is going back and forth in your inner ear. And as that fluid moves, it sends the signals to your brain that your head is moving. Now here's where I want you to, this is a lot of parents really appreciate this slide right here that I'm talking about because this is the continuum of vestibular input. And this is where when you go to an OT or you read on a site where they say, give them somatosensory input, use their vestibular system. But all they tell you is do vestibular activities. And you're like, I did that and it didn't work. Here's why. Because different input is registered differently. Head to foot is another way to say coddle to cephal, 
is this movement here is the most calming input we can receive. When we move the fluid in this canal that goes up and down, it calms our body down. So think about that. When you have an infant and you're holding that infant and you're trying to calm the crying baby down, you either hold them upright and you do this, right? Or you turn them sideways and you do this, right? You don't take a crying baby and go, hey, <laughs> right? It's head to butt. That's your calming input. I can't take my 13-year-old over my shoulder and do this. But I can do like the Spartan games and some athletic type things where I'm like, I'm going to run, sack you, you know, and like get the bigger person in your family to put them over their shoulder and run up the stairs, right? You can do, <laughs> depends on how big they are. I can do things where we go and we do a hip hop class together where there's a lot of this kind of input. I can get a large therapy ball and put it in front of the television or wherever their homework is being done and have them bounce up and down, right? I can modify the same brain head input depending on their age, right? I can have them take that big therapy ball, like this big white ball I've got here on my slide right there, and I can have them go head to butt where they do high fives on the floor, high fives with their feet, so they're rolling front to back, right? Bending forward is also on the calming end of that spectrum, the arousal spectrum of the vestibular system. So yoga poses, uh, Pilates poses, movements in general that have you bending forward are going to be calming down. You'll hear other speakers talk about having the candle, you know, blowing out your candle, blowing out your soup. Uh, <laughs> I think it used to be a candle, but then that became a gun. So now we do soup because <laughs> it can't be used as a weapon. <laughs> like, so blow on your soup. Your soup's too hot. Come to midline and lean forward. Because when you come to midline, the midline of your body, when you come together, you're squeezing the proprioceptive system, which will help calm as well. Coming up to that. Side to side is next. So this is neutral. When you see someone waiting in line, what movement do they do? Because, oh, I don't want to fall asleep. But if I alert myself too much, I'll hit someone. So this is a really good place for me to be. When baby's crying, we hold baby sideways. Baby, please fall asleep. But I don't want to get myself so aw awake that I can't go back to bed. It's 3 a.m. Let's go to back to bed. Right? The problem is we put the baby on our shoulder and we rock in the rocking chair. And then what happens? <laughs> and then we fall asleep. But if we can stand up and go side to side, we can keep ourselves in neutral, right? Elliptical, which is a large swing like this, is next. That's starting to become arousing. And then if you do a tight spin, you are on the high arousal continuum. So when you see a kid that's doing this, we're going to read their body language, okay? Is it rhythmic or irrhythmic? What is this? Rhythmic. So subconsciously, they are stimulating their vestibular system to calm themselves down. They are further going front to back and a little head to toe. So if your kid is at you and they're doing this kind of posturing, the signal you should hear is this kid's really trying to keep it together. Subconsciously, from a vestibular standpoint, this kid is trying to calm down. If they're pacing around and they're doing this kind of stuff, they're in fight or flight. And they're trying to arouse themselves to get away from you, to continue on to that continuum. Or if they're doing homework and they're trying not to fall asleep and they're like, ah, doing this kind of stuff, that's okay, because what is that child telling you they're trying to do? They're trying to wake up. If a child is doing a lot of these kinds of movements and they're supposed to be sitting still, then you read that behavior and you say, this kid needs energy. They're trying to heighten their energy, their up regulation, but they're doing it in an ineffective way. 
So can this be a movement break for us? Can we get up? Okay, buddy, I see you're moving around. Let's get up. Let's do three spins. They do their three spins. They alert themselves up. Then they can sit right back down and do their work. But if we tell them you need to sit still, stop moving, stop doing this, stop, 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 they're going to explode. Right? So that's kind of to look at what your kid is doing and how they, um, you can watch these behaviors and know if the child is trying to alert themselves or calm themselves down. I can look out here. It is 1 o'clock. Good grief. It's an hour after lunch. You're, all your blood's in your stomach right now. Y'all are tired. <laughs> but you're moving. You're taking drinks of things. You're moving around. People are tapping their legs. They're doing irregular movements to try and stay alert to hear me. If I get upset about that, I'm not meeting my goals, right? So let these kids have some freedom to move around and use it as a diagnostic. Another main point I want to drive home in our brief time together, and again, I know I'm not going to cover this in a full amount, and there is a podcast thing that goes into this in depth. But what I want you to know is the highlight of that 20-minute talk is that when you have information coming to your brain from your muscles, it goes on two different tracks. There's two different neural systems that input comes into your brain from, okay? We all understand if you touch something, you have the sensation, the sensory input, it comes up the spinal cord, right? It hits your brain, you have some sort of a reaction, and then it comes back out into the motor planning. Is everybody familiar with that? What I want to highlight is there's two different ways that input can come into your brain. The first is the big fancy, I'm just going to call it the proprioceptive thoughtful information track. You don't need to know the names of these. You need to know that there's a slow lane that comes up your spinal cord, and that is proprioception, and it's thoughtful. So again, proprioception is the ability to close your eyes and know where you are in space. It's the ability to know when I step down, I can motor plan that because I feel these steps below me. Have you ever walked down the stairs and thought there was an extra stair, right? So how does that look? You go, right? Because it's a slow reaction. You kind of jolt and you go, oh, there was an extra step, right? And then you correct. However, if we go through the other track and we do pain, light, temperature, and, and um, pain, light, touch, and temperature, that is reflexive survival. Who's got Legos at their house? <laughs> when you step on a Lego, do you say, I've stepped on a Lego? <laughs> no. What do you do? You go, ah! Who put the Legos out here? <laughs> Clean up the daggum Legos. <laughs> right? This track is fast, immediate survival. You go, oh, and then you and now analyze there was a Lego there, right? So two different types of input. But what's fantastic is they will override each other. The reason that this is the way it is is because that light touch, pain, and temperature track, it hits the thalamus inside the middle of the brain. That's the relay center. It hits that thalamus, and the thalamus says, is it safe? Are you going to die? And if it comes in through this track, the thalamus goes, you're going to die. <laughs> React without thinking. <laughs> and you do, right? But the proprioceptive hits the thalamus, and the thalamus says, you good, girl. You fine. Why don't you think about this for a minute? And you're like, OK, I got it. But actually, it's all like split second type stuff. Right, But what's really cool is when you get caught up in this light touch pain and temperature, if you add proprioceptive input to it, guess what happens? Your body is like, ah, no, you good at the same time. Okay? So what do we do when a toddler hurts themselves? They gash open their leg. Hopefully, if they have a connected relationship, they come run into this caregiver. Ah! What do we do for them? We get down, we grab the injury, and we kiss it. We rub it. 
We pull them in. We stimulate the proprioceptive tract, right? I promise you the bacteria in your lips is not helping that wound. <laughs> I promise you. What's helping is you're stimulating the proprioceptive tract to override the pain response. What's helping is you're making eye contact and you're telling the child that they are not alone in this event. So that's why when you get stung by a bee, what do you do? You rub it. You step on that Lego, what do you do? <laughs> you stomp a little bit <laughs> and you scream. Guess what screaming does? What does screaming do to the sternum? <sighs> when you scream, do you scream like this? <sighs> How do you scream? <sighs> you squeeze yourself. You get deep proprioceptive input. So here's the thing, another little thing for you to try with your kids at home. When the proprioceptive tract does not develop properly, because guess when it develops? It develops during diaper changes. It develops during falling when they're walking. And it develops in relationship. It's a hug. It's a pat on the bottom. It is a, I've changed your diaper. I don't change a baby's diaper and then immediately set them on the floor. What do I do? What's that? I pick them up and I squeeze them and I go, man, you smell a lot better. Right? I engage all my senses. When a baby's eating, I don't go, nama, 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 chew, chew, chew. I'm like, num, 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 chew, 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 you know? When you're looking at a baby, you don't pick up a baby and not do proprioceptive things. Ma, 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 ba, 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 those are all very proprioceptive activities. So when a child is neglected, when a child is yelled at, higher pitched noises don't go in your proprioceptive system. This right here is really annoying, and I'm going to high pitch you, but if I really want your attention, I'm going to come down lower. My stepmom had that to a perfection. She just lowered her octaves, and we were like, oh, yes, ma'am. Like, you know something's coming, right? But when she lowered her octaves to give us a lecture, we were like, yes, ma'am. We got very calm, right? Versus someone that's like, ah, nah, 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 and the kid's like, ah, nah, 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 right? So you can use that proprioceptive sense, but if they didn't get it, they don't develop it. Here's your little party trick. Take your little kid that's having proprioceptive issues that can't calm themselves down and have them close their eyes and stand on one leg. Guess what's going to happen? Woo! They're not going to know where they are. Because they're using their visual system to compensate for the proprioceptive. They're using their tactile system to compensate for the proprioceptive. Anybody else work with a kid that can't keep their hands out of your hair? Can't keep their hands off your body? Dude, my bubble is so big. Please stay out of my bubble. Right? Crashes into things. Has to watch TV upside down. Constantly jumping, constantly crashing, gauging gashes of their blood everywhere. What happened to you? Oh, I don't know. No clue about their body awareness because their proprioceptive system did not react well. So then what happens? What compensates the fight, flight, or fight, right? So that alerting system is getting a lot of practice. So guess what? That alerting system is having giant longhorn steers making the neural connections in their brain. So they are getting so many triggers right now that they don't need to have simply because the input of the information is going in the wrong track. So crap, what do we do about that, right? <laughs> How do we help that? We help it like we did developmentally. Just like Robin said, if you want to fix something, you've got to go back and you've got to do it through the developmental sequence, neurosequential therapy. So many big, smart people are talking about this. We've got to go back and we've got to have relationship 
where we do little bits of fight flight followed by regulation. And I'm not talking about purposely make your kid mad. I'm talking about the just right levels of stress and then come back through in relationship. When I change the baby's diaper, that's not a pleasant experience, right? But when I took that unpleasant experience and I added proprioceptive, I calmed the system afterwards. I taught the system how to self-calm. So when I present this food, when they're picky eaters, and I say, okay, we got to do some feeding type therapies, number one, don't do it at night when everybody's tired. Make dinner time what it's supposed to be, relationship. If all they eat is mac and cheese, well, fine. Feed them mac and cheese every night. I don't care. At lunchtime, when they're feeling better, and it's not a big deal that everybody gets along at dinner time, sneak in a carrot if they're ready for it. Steam it, cook it, make it some way that they can accept it. That's going to stress them out. After they eat that, then you go play hoops. Then you give them a hug. Then you give them a warm bubble bath. You follow that negative experience with a nice, big, proprioceptive, calming experience. Does this make sense? Oh, we got to do homework. Homework is hard. Let's just, you know, do five problems. We'll do five whatever. We'll set a timer for 20 minutes. Sometimes that sets a kid off to set a timer. Do what works for you. Make it a manageable chunk, but right as they're starting to get stressed out, give them some high fives. Do some wall push-ups. Have them hold a weighted blanket. I brought some weighted blankets for you guys to see. These things are amazing. I'll pass that around. That's just like a weighted shawl. It's nice and heavy. These are proprioceptive inputs that you can do. And she, uh, Stacy was joking about me getting in the Lycra. I love Lycra. I'm a huge Lycra person. Are you ready? It's going to be heavy. There you go. Uh, but I engage that proprioceptive system. And that's my goal is to do an override. Okay, so here's another way to look at how the sensory information comes in. Deep touch and proprioceptive, they go to the cortex. The thalamus gets that information and says engage the frontal brain. So when you have a person who's freaking out, have you ever been on scene of a fire? And the police officer and the firemen, they're all standing out there. And what do they give people that come out of a fire? Do they give them a fan to blow themselves off? A blanket. Do you think the person's cold? They just left a burning building. I'm just saying. We live in Texas. <laughs> Why do we put blankets on trauma, acute trauma victims? Shock, for one, because all the blood is inside and we are trying to keep them warm. But do they give them thermal blankets that would actually keep them very warm, that are really lightweight? No, they're big, heavy wool blankets. Because they know that that proprioceptive system calms it down. When a woman is in labor, what do we do? We beat on them, we rub on them, we do all kinds of proprioceptive things so that they can override that. So if you hear nothing else from me today, I want you to know, look at the reason why the child is doing the behavior Try and say, is it something else? You know, what's, what are they getting from this? And then get into that proprioceptive system. Um, and that's just more of that same type of thing that teaches you where the, where the receptors are and all that. We don't really have time for that. But I love Lycra. The reason I use the Lycra so much is because a lot of my kids can't be touched for lots of reasons. But the Lycra provides that tactile input and that squeezing input to give a relational proprioceptive intervention without crossing boundaries that they have hard triggers for, right? If someone puts the Lycra on them, I can now rub their back through the Lycra, right? And then they have control of the Lycra. This is one of my favorite. And, and again, everything you do, you have to think through it and you have to understand what this child has been through. That's the whole trauma practice. And this is one of my, my stories of a failed intervention that I will share with you because, you know, I think it's kind of funny. It was traumatic at the moment, but we got past it. But I have a snake that will swallow the kids up. And in my head, this was a brilliant idea. <laughs> so sometimes you do things 
And you're like, who doesn't want to be swallowed by a snake? Apparently a lot of kids. <laughs> so who knew? <laughs> but some kids love it. I don't know. I thought it was funny. In my mind, I saw this as a proprioceptive event where they got to crawl through a big squeezy thing. And, and at the time, one of the current theories that was going around was the whole rebirth thing, which is its whole, I'm not even going to go into that. But there is something to like going through a birth canal and being squeezed. And guess what going through the birth canal gives you? Proprioceptive input. And talk about meeting something dysregulating. Nice comfy womb. It was God's way of saying, I'm going to squeeze you real good. Get you nice and regulated before you're like, well, what happened? But the first thing we do is then we swaddle them back up. That's normal development. And there was a whole thing about C-sections. And, you know, my kid was a C-section. They ripped her out of me. It was very traumatic. Literally ripped her out. They looked at my husband and they're like, you can be with one of them. They're both going to die. And he was like, I take the baby. And I'm like, I'm still awake. <laughs> I haven't quite forgiven him for that yet. <laughs> Working on it. She doesn't know you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I don't know what happened to my clicker here. Okay. I've lost my clicker, which... Oh, thank you. I usually have to designate someone as my clicker spot. Okay. Anyway, use Lycra. It's just amazing. Flexion is going to be calming. Extension is going to be alerting. Okay. So I love the idea of hugging a child from behind. And when I say that, I don't mean surprise them. I don't mean like, I love you, <laughs> because that's not going to work. <laughs> when you do, I love you, they're going to be like, extension. That's too alerting. But if the child is allowed to back into you, they maintain control, which means they're using their frontal cortex, which means they're in the calming part of their brain. If you have any kind of issue, you can always put a pillow in front of you. Those giant bears at Costco are fabulous. Come give the big bear a hug and let the child back in because here's what happens. When the child backs in, it puts the child in flexion. I'm a bigger girl. And when I hug a child because of my anatomy, guess where that kid's head goes? <laughs> Not ideal when I'm trying to calm them down. When they're little, perfect. And I will tell you, my daughter right now, it's so awkward. She's 13. I don't know how to hug her. Like, I just, it's weird. And it's my own kid, and I'm pretty sure she doesn't have any Me Too moments. But I still don't know how to hug her to not develop something. You know what I'm saying? So I do that. I put a blanket on top of me, and I sit on the couch, and I'm like, come watch Gilmore with me. Watch some Gilmore Girls or Sheldon or whatever. And then she lays on top and I wrap the blanket around her and I hug her like a big taco. Because she still needs that proprioceptive input. She's my sensory seeker kid. But if I run up to her and I'm like, come here and give me a hug, we're both going like this now. It's really weird. I don't like it. So I have to find other ways. Uh, blowing and sucking, things that are going to bring you to midline are going to be calming. These little, that's just a piece of lycra I've hung up in my little... It's my formal dining room. <laughs> if you want to come eat with me, it's going to be a rude awakening. Uh, <laughs> get more than you bargain for. But yeah, like I just have these little nests that she can get in and get all proprio-sized and feel better. This silly sack, it's one of my favorite interventions. They're really cheap. I make them. They're super simple. Uh, I used to call them the body bag until my husband said that's probably not the best idea. Uh, so now I've changed the name to the silly sack. And what's really fun, I was actually doing a big conference in Norway, and we happened to be there for their national day where everybody dresses up in their really cool outfits. It's one of the coolest things I've ever done. Uh, and they had Grandma in her national day outfit, and I brought extra silly sacks for this family, the host family that we were staying with. And Grandma got in and chased her grandson around there. I mean, it was the best. It has no age limit. There's no limits to the silly sack. And, you know, you can do all these different things. What's cool about this is this is what I call just right regulation. Because what is she doing? She's stimulating the proprioceptive system, right? But what is, what's her body? Where's her vestibular system? It's in alert because nothing happens in isolation. So this super dysregulated kid is now completely regulated because she is learning 
that she can be dysregulated and regulated at the same time. Because that's what life is. I don't want my clients to leave my care like this. I want them to be able to go to a concert and be like, yeah, but then be able to leave and not trash the venue, right? <laughs> There's a lot of people that still need to learn this skill. <laughs> but that's what I want. I want my daughter to get mad at me. You don't let me express my feelings. I'm going to fail Latin and my life is doomed. I'm going to be homeless. Let that out and then let me help you in relationship to come back to it. Because if you never get stressed out, you'll never learn coping skills. So every argument we have, I'm like, dang it. Oh, hey, I get to repair. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> and we have better coping strategies as we go forward. Okay. Uh, this is my hallway. If you think you don't have enough space for Lycra, my niece moved in with us, took over my therapy room. I didn't have a bedroom. I'm like, guess what you get to live in? <laughs> we can hang lycra from all your walls and you could sleep in a hammock. It's great. Uh, but since she took my therapy room, I literally put hooks in my hallway. So when you open my front door, if you come during a session, you're like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> and what's really cool is I figured out if you use canvas photos, you could just put them right over the hooks. Nobody knows they're there. For all they know, we're a normal, adjusted family. <laughs> uh, this was <laughs> when I went up to Canada, had some friends that we discovered you can use the Lycra to sleep on a plane. It's a really good tip. If you're going over to do an international adoption, take your Lycra. How many of you actually pull your arms into your sleeves of your sweatshirts anyway? Your kids are doing this anyway. They're self-medicating with that Lycra. Uh, so then we have music. And I'll hit on these real quick. Again, you can go do the pod beads and get more information, uh, and it's free. 60 beats per minute is calming. 120 is alerting because the heartbeat is 60 to 80. So if you, this is one of the best ways to co-regulate with your kid. Robin was talking about match, the, and I, give me your word. Robin's not, yeah, what, match their excitement, but not, match their energy, but not their dysregulation, right? Is that what your words were? Okay. This is the best way to match their energy, right? Play music that they're both on the same level. If your kid comes in and they're ADHD and they're really hyperactive, play some really hyperactive music. And that'll get you guys on the same page. And then you can bring the music down slowly. And then you both co-regulate down. But you cannot play Mozart for a kid that's doing ACDC in their mind. It does not work. <laughs> so pull out the Lady Gaga, pull out the Imagine Dragons, do something that's up here, and then slowly come down in relationship together. Um, the other thing is, again, the eye movement can also affect the activity levels, and we talked a little bit about that. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna just wrap up real quick. Uh, it is located in the back of the brain. We talked about a lot of this going in, but I also wanna talk about how focal vision is calming and extraneous vision is gonna be alerting. So when you see a kid that's flapping out here and they're doing this kind of stuff, they're trying to awake, they're trying to arouse themselves up, they're going into that dissociation, right? So they're trying to come back to you. That's what their body language is telling you that they're trying to wake back up. Um, and again, when Robin was talking about kids that are really you know, within themselves and she tosses a balloon at them, it hits their peripheral vision and it causes you to wake up. So um, just know about that as well. So we're going to go into um, the picky eating was one of the things I wanted to talk about. And in your handouts, some of you, if, can I have you hold that up for me? Because I see that you have it. When you go online, Stacy emailed you all a, um, a handout from me. And if, can I just borrow that for a second? And on there, you're going to find these charts because I am out of time. And I, please go look at these. This is what I want you to go home with. I gave you some theory today. I hope I, I, I want to lower your expectations and raise your compassions. I want you to look at these behaviors and go, you know what? This kid did not wake up trying to make me mad. This kid woke up trying to make their body feel right. 
And so maybe this afternoon I gave you some clues of what their body is telling you non-verbally. And then in those handouts are some practical strategies of if they won't eat anything, try some of these ideas. And again, go online. I, you know, an hour and a half is not enough time to teach you all of this, but I tried to give you synapses. I hope it was helpful. So there you go.